Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rachana Pradhan. I'm a correspondent with Kaiser. Or I almost got my own name wrong. KFF Health News. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know it's the end of the day, right? Um, based here in Washington. And uh, with me is an all-star panel here. We're going to be talking about a health system that meets patients where they are. I'll do brief introductions, and then we will just get underway. So immediately to my left here, we have Ananya Banerjee. She's the chief commercial officer with Allidaid. Then we have Nikayla Cook, the executive director of the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, otherwise known as PCORI. David Dill, chairman and CEO of LifePoint Health. Florian Otto, CEO and co founder of Cedar. And then Kent Thielen, vice president of Mayo Clinic. <clears throat> so, this session, so we will eventually have QA, so I'll let you all know how to participate in that, but otherwise, I'm going to start right now. Um, so for all five of you, I want you to weigh in on this first question for the group. Um, we're going to talk about patient engagement during this session. And could you talk about, in your opinion, what is the single largest barrier in having success in patient engagement programs? And Anya, you want to start? Because you're right next to me, so I get to pick on you. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll jump right in. So I think patient engagement, um, I, I think the single biggest barrier is healthcare is complicated, and we need to find ways to simplify our messaging to be able to engage patients. Um, and it's uh, our messaging still continues to be extremely complicated, and our ability to have multimodal engagement models is critical. If they engage best on text, we should be able to engage them on text. Phone calls, you know, just having that multimodality is really important. Uh, and that's just something that you know has gotten better, but we can do a lot more work. Michaela, what do you think? Great. Well, at PCORI, we focus quite a bit on engagement of patients and research. And I think a lot of the lessons that we've learned around engagement and research also apply to clinical practice and even health systems. And one of the things that we've recognized in our engagement work is how important it is to build trust and to really participate in communities in terms of getting to know them, understand communities, understand where patients are coming from before there's a health issue, before there's a research protocol, you know, building that opportunity for creating the reciprocal relationships that are going to be critical when the time is necessary for that to really take place because of a, a research question protocol or um, yeah. something that's happening in the healthcare setting. So there are a couple of principles that I think we've learned a lot about. One is that building of that co-learning opportunity where um, both the community, patients, and others really understand what it takes to be a full participant in their care, in their research. Um, also the fact that the relationship is not unidirectional. It's really about reciprocal relationships and inclusivity and being part of um, the, the system itself and understanding what that means to be part of the research, part of healthcare delivery, and really participating in an equal way, as well as the importance of honesty, transparency, and trust, which I've talked about, which are really, I think, foundations of how you think about inclusive approaches to engagement. And I think those are real challenges. While we've learned a lot about those things, those are huge challenges. And so it takes a constant effort and a constant um, attention to overcoming those challenges. I think for us, our organization is a, uh, a large, uh, we have a large footprint in many states. We're taking care of patients in acute care settings, in physician practices, uh, in uh, behavioral hospitals. About 10% of our business comes from uh, physician clinic visits. And when I think about patient engagement in that setting where uh, it's a scheduled visit, uh, some of our surgical visits are also scheduled visits. I think it's a little bit easier, but uh, we, we shouldn't forget and can't forget that most of the business and most of the interactions that we have are unscheduled. And uh, that recognition of a patient's mind is completely somewhere else. Uh, and we have a lot of tools that we bring to the table. We have a lot of technology that we bring to the table uh, and a lot of compassion around making sure that Yes, we're engaging with patients in a lot of different ways, but a recognition that we're taking care 
of a lot of patients and their families in their greatest time of need when, when their mind may not be in the place that I want it to be, to be able to check a box to say, we're doing a great job engaging with our patients, making sure our care teams are there. I think about price transparency uh, the same way, way we've been big champions of price transparency, which I think we can all agree is important. Uh, but when someone is in an operating room or in an emergency room after an accident or an incident, uh, the last thing they're really thinking about is how much is this going to cost? So keeping our teams focused on uh, in the greatest time of need, taking the best care of patients possible as close to home as possible. Yeah, I think the most important thing on, on, on patient engagement is um, literally not too different from engagement <coughs> anywhere else in the consumer world. So what does that mean on the technology side? You need to be, of course, um, immediate, you need to be convenient, you need to be mobile first, and you need to be absolutely personalized. And I think this personalization is one of the aspects that totally misses right now in, in healthcare. So when we right now open, I think, our Uber app, Uber knows where we want to go before we open the app. Or if we just don't have one Spotify experience, right? There are, I think, 250 million Spotify experiences. Every single app looks different. Mm -hmm. And that makes total sense. This one size fits all is actually not, uh, one size fits none. And um, looking at the medical side of healthcare, personalized medicine is not that, I mean, it's not that young, right? I, mean, I think 40, 50 years ago, we understood that every human being is different. And that is on the clinical side, but that's also on the administrative engagement side. So we strongly believe that um, an absolute personalization where everybody gets the experience that is relevant for them through technology will drive also up engagement. We are seeing this with our clients as well. In our organization, <clears throat> our primary value is that the needs of the patient come first. And one of the key tenets of that is making sure that we're listening to the patients and understanding what their needs are. More and more patients are quickly deciding that they want to receive care when they want, where they want, how they want, in a manner that they want. So that requires us to really think differently. I think one of the barriers that exist currently is just limiting beliefs about what's possible as an organization, as care providers. Uh, I think we learned over the COVID pandemic, we can do much more in a much shorter period than we ever thought possible. We need to maintain that kind of a mindset so that we can move forward with some of these technologies in a way that really meets the patients where they are at. So, okay, Ken, I'm gonna ask you, um, because Mayo um, has been investing a lot in remote and virtual care, can you talk a little bit about the hospital at home approach that um, you are involved in and just how uh, you all are shifting management of patients, even uh, my understanding, right, of patients that get, have quite acute healthcare needs, um, but they're not showing up in, in facilities themselves. Yep, and so uh, as one of our sub-platforms and our platform approach to how we're trying to change the way that care is delivered, um, three years ago we rolled out something we call um, advanced care at home, that's our home hospital capability. Many other organizations have been pursuing this capability. We're actually rolling it out before the COVID pandemic. Um, some of the regulatory changes that happened associated with the pandemic allowed us to accelerate that capability. But we're now three years into delivering care in, uh, to patients remotely in the comfort of their own home. As an organization, we have some of the most high acuity um, serious types of, of patient care needs for our patients. These are not transitional patients. These are patients all the way up to just below the ICU level. Um, we've now been able to care for roughly 3,000 patients. Um, we've saved close to 11,000 bed days for our patients, and we've transitioned to be able to, and expanded to be able to deliver this across our organization, across the country in multiple geographic locations. We had lots of retrospective insights that we've been able to gain by looking at the outcomes for these patients, and what we found is that these patients prefer this actually compared to the bricks and mortar environment. Their outcomes related to 30-day um, readmissions, 30-day mortality, um, those types of things are actually equivalent to, and in some cases a little bit better, but those were retrospective data. Now we're, now we're taking another look in a prospective randomized controlled trial way. In fact, we just finished enrollment of a large trial um, comparing bricks and mortar versus the home hospital environment last week. Um, we'll be following those patients for a little bit here into the future to be able to accumulate all the data necessary, but we'll finally, for the first time, be able to have a large randomized controlled trial comparing those two. And then we've taken that information and the lessons learned there to be able to roll some of those capabilities into different ways of caring for patients like cancer care outside of the traditional bricks and mortar yeah, environment. How, um, how long will you be following those patients for? I was gonna ask you a data question actually, so what are you measuring um, as a part of that? Other, is it other than outcomes, what are the key? So some of the primary measures are, 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 as you might anticipate, um, 
30-day mortality, readmission, secondary measures related to falls, medication, misadministrations, uh, ED visits, and several other things. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have some of our first insights into the data after 30 days, but we'll continue to follow them beyond that time period. That's interesting. Um, so, and Ananya, I'm wondering, can you talk about this a bit, which is, so we know there's a body of research showing that when patients are engaged in their healthcare, um, you know, it is better for them for outcomes, but um, what do we know about like that specifically? So how, how does it improve health outcomes? Yeah, so we, we see it across the board, right? Like uh, um, we all know preventative care helps. And so by engaging the PCPs more, we can make sure that we are getting more annual wellness visits done, which absolutely you know, shows up in the total cost of care data as well as patient satisfaction data. Um, we also know that one of the barriers that has traditionally hindered appropriate care is whenever the patient coverage type changes, right? Like they move from Medicaid to exchanges, it's almost like they're starting all over again. And one of the things we have been able to do is manage that care across different coverage types. So again, that's another thing that really helps make sure that the patient isn't starting over every single time some life change happens. So those, those are, again, very specific examples on how that continuity of care helps them stay engaged in the process, which then leads to better outcomes. How does the model work if, if you have a change in coverage or insurance, but then you won't, as you know, I mean, you can change even in a one type of payer, um, you could change a plan and then all of a sudden your, your oncologists, your primary care docs, everyone's out of network, everything, right? And then you can't see those people anymore. So how does that, could you yeah. talk about that? So, so that change happens because the benefit changes. But what, right. what, if you still continue to see your primary care physician and what uh, the, the layer that Allodate provides is because we do value-based care across all payer types, right? Mm -hmm. Like whether you're a traditional Medicare, Medicare Advantage, commercial, or Medicaid, <coughs> we cover the entire panel. So once you do that, it does not matter what kind of payer coverage they have, you, are, you do have access to everything that's going on with the patient, and that helps us bring that continuity. So uh, plus with our transitions of care model, if the patient ends up in a hospital, our physicians are able to call them up, do the follow-ups, mm -hmm and make sure that you know, they don't end up again in the ER. And so that continuity of care, mm -hmm. again, adds to the patient engagement as well as overall value to society. Mm -hmm. um, David, you talked about this already a little bit, but I wonder if you could flesh it out, which is you know, when you are in a very acute healthcare situation, cardiac event, a stroke, um, some other emergency, Anyone who, even people who are well versed in the U.S. healthcare system, what I would consider to be well versed, um, you know that that's not where their head is at. They're they're worried about very basic needs. So, um, is there a future for patient engagement programs in that kind of setting, and what does that even look like? So we we have uh, we we have a lot of technology that we use. I love a lot of the words that we've used up here: listening to patients and compassionate care and. Trust, I think, is, is, is a big part of it. The unique part of our business model is in most of our hospitals, we're the only hospital in town. Uh, we're the only hospital in the community. So when the hospital fails, if it fails, and it, we make sure it doesn't fail, then patients have to leave and go a long way for care. And that could be for certain service lines. It could be for certain specialties. Uh, that, that we may or may not uh, provide. So uh, as, we, uh, as we've grown the organization, this notion of partnerships has been a critical thread that is woven through our whole company, a notion that we cannot do it all on our own. So whether we have partnerships with leading academic medical centers to provide uh, continuity of care in communities, partnerships with venture studios, for example, innovation for us. We realize we're not good at launching new organizations. We have formed a partnership with a venture studio company where we can launch companies together. So listening to a specific need and 
part of our patient engagement, the tool set that we have developed, have been launched with our venture studio company to connect patients together, uh, to make it as easy for them to access the healthcare system and to have great follow-up. It's a little bit easier in some sense for us because we're the only hospital in the community. Uh, but it's a little bit harder because we're the only hospital in the community. All right. But it's a recognition of in patients and their families' greatest time of need, we are that trusted partner to take care of them. Right, so um, I want to ask about the, the adventure that you have with Loyal. So because it's, it's been well documented, of course, the challenges with rural healthcare access, um, which seems to increasingly be dwindling across the United States, um, how does a model like that work when someone does have to potentially travel tens or hundreds of miles to get to a specialist, to get to a, a facility that would be able to treat maybe a more acute need? And Loyal is an organization uh, that we have partnered with to develop a robust uh, set of tools uh, to connect with patients, making it easy and seamless to uh, schedule a visit, easy and seamless to schedule appointments within the hospital. So it's not just in the ambulatory setting, it's also in the acute care setting. Because of the partnerships that I mentioned, we're also guests in a lot of partners' homes. There's another uh, speaker just down the hall at Tampa General, John, and we have built a rehabilitation hospital with John. So connecting into their patient technology tools that they have and patient engagement tools that they have. So it's, it's not one size fits all. Uh, so as we think about our business, we think about our partnership that we have <coughs> with many organizations, but Loyal is the one that you mentioned, uh, developing purpose-built solutions that work in our communities. And I think that's been the best part of the relationship that we have with Loyal. It's also one of the best parts of the relationships that we ha uh, relationship that we have with the Venture Studio Company, building purpose-built companies that are unique to the problems that we're dealing with within, within our communities. Um, Florian, Cedar had a, a big announcement today um, related to some new features focused on financial assistance for patients. Um, so including uh, allowing people to enroll in Medicaid coverage, uh, should they qualify, and then also like uh, connecting people, uh, making it easier to connect with financial assistance programs through hospitals. Um, as we know, most patients do not know about financial assistance programs or it's very difficult when they are working with the hospital to try to get enrolled in those. Um, what's different now? Given that we know about these long-standing challenges, can you talk about, so what's different and what is making hospitals want to do this now? Uh, very good question and, and, and glad you brought it up. So a um, lo lo lot of answers to that. So I think the reasons why hospitals, of course, want that, so your last question first and then I'll explain a bit more about it, is I think fairly simple. Hospitals are in this business because they deeply care about patients and it's part of their mission. Um, to help literally every single patient within their communities. And that is not only for the rich people that have the money, but also for the underserved. Um, and then secondly, of course, we know margin of healthcare systems is pretty low, are pretty low. So if they don't get paid right now for the care that they are providing, this goes directly to the bottom line and the financial viability of the system. So for the healthcare system, I think it's an absolute no-brainer. To the beginning of the question, what is basically the problem and what are we doing against this right now? And what changed is the following. So um, you might know these shocking statistics that in the US there are around 100 million people with medical debt. We did a survey recently um, that half of the patients feel that the medical debt and payments is affecting negatively their chances of healing. And that is of course heartbreaking. And I know this as a doctor, sometimes patients come to us and say, they are completely heartbroken because they don't have the money for a certain medication. So it is a massive problem. And then comes the, the number that really, I think, proves what you said correctly, is that 63% of patients are not aware that financial assistance exists. So we launched basically this, um, this technology, the Affordability Navigator, which is a set of a few products to help patients guide them through the process. So the first is the Medicaid enrollment. So we partnered with Advocacia, which is a um, uh, Medicaid enrollment company where digitally you can, the patient can navigate and re-enroll in Medicaid. Why is that so important? We all know about Medicaid redetermination um, earlier this year that happened. So 10 million people lost coverage of Medicaid. 
That's absolutely a big problem. Those are patients that right now will go bankrupt. We need to re-enroll them if it's possible because a lot of them lost the coverage because of procedural problems. We are helping them with the technology side. Second thing is a financial assistance screening. We are helping patients. There are a lot of other financial assistances um, uh, or, or programs available for patients. And we are helping them in a digital way, like a concierge way, to, with a very easy questions to check whether they might be available for something. Then um, a payment plan um, advisory. So what is that? Um, very often patients that don't have the money, they're ashamed of calling the health system and saying, I need a payment plan. We are helping them in doing this in a digital way. They can do the self-service on their mobile phone in less than three minutes. And that, of course, is really good. We currently have 400,000 payment plans on our platform at any given time. And then there are also other things that we are doing, for example, on the discounting for true self-pay. So true self-pay or the pseudo-insurance, I sometimes call them, is if they have $5,000 deductible, they're basically uninsured patients. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do for those patients is we need to make it manageable for them. Besides payment plans, we need to give them discounts. The very, very interesting piece is discounts are not only good for the mission, but also good for the margin of the healthcare system. Why is that? I mean, discounts work everywhere. We all buy discounts everywhere, in grocery, in retail. They work. And they also work to pay the healthcare bill. So using machine learning algorithms to, certain, to reduce certain bill size, of course, not everybody, not at every time, but doing discrimination there helps actually quite a lot. Um, we, have, we have seen a, pay, uh, um, a client where we have uh, launched this, 10% increase in the payment rates, although we asked for 30% less average bill. So it's really interesting. Well, so I was going to ask you, so what is your pitch to get hospitals to work with you, given that you are reducing the amount that patients are paying to them for care that they've delivered? Um, I, 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 I might push back on that. That's not the case. We are not reducing the amount that, pay, that um, patients pay to hospitals. We are reducing the number that is being invoiced. We are increasing the number that is being paid. Mm. And that is the interesting piece. In the end, you as a hospital right now, let's just make the total man monkey math. One billion dollar healthcare system might make something like 50 million in patient collections, but invoices are 100 million. Mm -hmm. So what is the fundamental problem and, and the opportunity? To get the 50 million in patient <coughs> collections to 65 million. And that's usually what we are seeing with clients. Mm -hmm. That's 15 million dollars over a billion in net patient service revenue. That's 1.5% additional to the bottom line, because every single dollar collected for service or rent goes to the bottom line. 1.5% of additional profit margin for healthcare system is super relevant. And you get that by asking for less, and that is the critical piece. So one of the things that, uh, that, that do you mind if I jump in no, and ask him a question? Is that fair? <laughs> I, 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 do not, I do not want this at all. <laughs> Came off. I'm sorry. Here, I'll fix it. And I'll, it's less uh, pressure for me. I'll, I'll fix it in just a second. So uh, our company is located in 30 states, and, and one of our largest states is in the state of North Carolina. The state of North Carolina just recently expanded Medicaid uh, that goes into effect December the 1st. Uh, I was just on the phone before the conversation up here with our team about are we doing everything that we can to ensure that we're getting patients the financial support that they need and the education around that. And we're working with the insurance companies, we're working with the state, we're working with the State Hospital Association. So this is a very important time when we're the, you're the only hospital in these communities, every patient that needs care is coming into our health care system. And we can see a disproportionate amount of our self-pay visits in our emergency departments are in states that have not expanded Medicaid. And many states have expanded Medicaid over time. We still have a few that haven't. North Carolina is a big one. It's an enormous opportunity, not just for the health system, but most importantly, for, this, for residents of North Carolina that need access to care. How can your organization help make sure that, that we're doing everything that we can do to get patients enrolled in Medicaid as efficiently as possible? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question, and, and, and I think there are, there are a lot of things we can do. I think the first thing, why, why is this Medicaid enrollment the big problem? First is redetermination, but the second problem are the gig workers. Why are gig workers? They're not a problem, but the, but the system is a problem for the gig workers. They're dropping in and out of Medicaid all the time. 
because sometimes they're earning too much money that they're above the threshold, sometimes not enough. But every time you drop out, you need to re-enroll, and they don't know it. Now comes the second big opportunity on that. In most of the states, I don't know North Carolina, we need to find that out, but you can retroactively after a visit, enroll in Medicaid, you have something like 60 days, and then retroactively get paid by Medicaid. Although reimbursement is not the highest for Medicaid, it is super important. So how do you basically get to them? First of all, you need to make it extremely easy and you need to go proactively to their patients. Waiting that they will reach out to anybody to try to get to this process and enroll in Medicaid, good luck, that's not going to happen. But as a healthcare system, you need to go to them. Um, there's no chance to do that with manual labor. Why? Because first of all, it's absolutely cost prohibitive to do this. And secondly, also, the quality is very divergent. Sometimes some agents are really good, some are average. Um, so the only real solution for that is technology. And the good news is that even the underserved, um, most vulnerable patients, they are usually on their phones. So what we are doing is we're doing it purely on the digital side, and we should talk after the panel about that and how we can do this. Um, uh, to engage the patient where they are, with the message that they understand, in the language that they understand, um, and give them literally all the options that they have. So the personalization is the big, um, is the big um, piece of that. But I think the very, very first step is, and that's why I'm so happy that you, that you brought this up, is for the healthcare system to understand our patients in the markets need it. And if we help them, we help a lot the entire healthcare system as well. Yeah, of course, Nick. Yeah, I just go ahead. wanted to add something to this because I think we're talking about some really important issues around the medical care cost burden that patients and families and others carry. But I also just wanted to raise attention to the non-medical and the indirect costs that patients and families and others carry as well because I think those are barriers to the full engagement. And what we are recognizing is that some of those relate to economic burdens like um, presenteeism and absenteeism at work or even the ability really to, to manage and care coordinate and things of that nature and what effort it takes um, for families to do that. And that there's not a systematic way in which that is understood, collected, data and outcomes and evidence aren't really available there. And so we've been working on really trying to build a taxonomy of these patient-centered economic outcomes that are important to patients and families and caregivers and other stakeholders, including healthcare systems, because I think that kind of information may be important to know, that starts to categorize you know, these types of um, economic burdens that patients experience and to garner and gather the evidence and the data related to different interventions and systems or different types of therapies that are introduced and what those economic outcomes really are about for patients that we all need to care and pay attention to. And so I just wanted to introduce that additional element that I think is critically important and what we hear a lot about in our mm -hmm. engagement efforts. Right. Could I just ask a follow-up? Yeah. So I completely agree, right? Like there's a whole host of um, uh, cost categories we don't actively talk about. Mm -hmm what's the path to bridge that gap, right? Because typically insurers don't cover it or like there, there isn't like a clear path to a solution there. Do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I think one of the things that we've been really focused on is number one, understanding um, a perspective of what patient-centered value is all about and um, really talking to the, the varied um, components of the healthcare ecosystem to really portray that collection of those perspectives and what domains are starting to emerge there and then starting to collect data that helps people to understand even what that really is because I feel like once we start to collect that information, categorize it in ways that has a clear taxonomy, then maybe we can start to build toward the bridge to solutions. And so we're early in that work but are certainly um, interested in what it can uh, bring to the conversation. So on, on research actually, Nikhila, I wanted to ask about now, um, what impact did the pandemic have on people's willingness to participate in clinical research? And so could you, is, it, is it for the better? Are people more willing now, given collectively what happened? Or is it, are people more skeptical of participating in scientific research? That's a really good question, and I, you know, I would say there are many things we learned during the pandemic, and um, some of them we've already heard about, which we learned we could do things faster, we could actually do things differently. Um, we could come together around areas that have been challenging before, and we had partners and, um, and groups talking to each other that hadn't previously, and we certainly have been able to capitalize on some of that benefit, but we also learned a lot about the challenges of trust um, as it relates to healthcare and um, research, and we certainly recognize that a 
lot of the work that um, we've been talking about here related to patient engagement is one of the ways in which we can build trust and trustworthiness amongst patients and, um, and communities. And we learned a lot about the opportunities to use those that are closest to the patient to really understand what the community is about, um, what's the best way to interact. And um, those community brokers became really important for us during the pandemic. And those are other ways that we're starting to think about how do we transcend some of the barriers we're seeing with some of the lessons learned from the pandemic. And one of the things we've learned about patient engagement is that it certainly can enhance trust and trustworthiness, increase recruitment and retention in research studies, and that those are pathways for us to really try to overcome some of the challenges that we saw during the pandemic related to public trust and research and in, in medical care and health care in general. And so we see those paths as real opportunities for us to double down and continue to move forward in that opportunity to recruit and retain and research. Are, are there organizations like that we would maybe characterize is kind of non-traditional that are sort of trying to do these things that you're talking about? Yes, indeed. I think there are, um, I would say, a lot of community-based organizations as well as um, entities within communities, such as community health workers mm -hmm. and others that we've recognized are true partners for us in the research enterprise. And so we've, um, at Procore, even before the pandemic, really recognized that we have to bring research outside of the academic halls and into the communities in order to really meet people where they are and to understand what's important to them in order to make sure that the research that we fund really has the outcomes that are most important to those we care to serve. And so that work, I think, is a component of building the partnerships with those community-based organizations as well as with community health workers and others that can be participatory in that. One of the examples of um, something that we funded or uh, uh, awards will be announced actually um, later on this month is an initiative called the Partner Initiative where we've um, really engaged community-based organizations to be partners, full partners, with academic researchers in order to address needs around maternal health care. Um, and we know this is an area that is um, of high importance in terms of where we stand in the world, really, related to maternal health outcomes, and that a lot of that burden is carried by populations that have been disproportionately engaged in research, as well as um, have disproportionate burden of poorer outcomes. And this is one of the ways in which we've heard from our stakeholders, partners, and community organizations that they know the strategies that work best in their communities. And being a full partner in which they're able to be part of the design, the conduct, and the dissemination of the research results and be part of the ones making the decisions about the work and how it's carried out is one of the ways that we think we really have an opportunity to overcome these types of barriers that we've been talking about in terms of engaging those. Yeah, yeah. I would just add and echo those thoughts. As an organization like Mayo Clinic, one thing that we've recognized is that we need to do exactly as you've stated. I can just share from our organization standpoint, we've, we've taken some different approaches, like for instance, creating facilities in geographic locations where we typically wouldn't be that can attract more diverse patient populations, something we call a community health collaborative. It provides an itis for education. It, it lowers the barriers for enrollment in some of our clinical trials. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it also reduces barriers for transportation to our larger academic centers amongst a number of other entities. And then we've also partnered in our community, for instance, with for one example would be the American Legion around um, prostate cancer awareness, treatment, and prevention for black males. So, yep, we're doing exactly as you described, and, it, and it's very effective. And it's amazing, these community organizations like you're referring to, how engaged they are and how much they're wanting that engagement with us and appreciating Absolutely. it. So I'll add on to that. Right. Like we've also seen so much evidence, when, like when we've done RCTs, and I'll use the example of advanced care planning, right? Like that's something that we have, like over 90% positive responses from patients as well as physicians, because advanced care planning is not the most easy conversation to have. Mm -hmm. Yet it's such an important conversation to have that without kind of a structure to help us get there, it's 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 difficult. But when we've done the RCT, it's the, the results have been incredibly positive, and it's just something that's a win-win-win. But without putting that, you know, that uh, sort of uh, challenge out there, we would have never seen the positive outcome. So when it comes to research, of course, the increasing participation is one challenge. But then, as I know, Pokori is very involved in this work. Uh, in particular, it's uh, actually getting. Uh, you know, medical practices to change how they practice, right? And like implementing the findings. So 
uh, the HSII initiative, right, mm -hmm. is something PCORI is doing. So I was astounded because I remember when the announcement about this came out, um, you all noted that it takes an estimated 17 years between published results uh, for research uh, being actually taken up and practiced. Um, so what is the goal with that initiative? Because you're partnering with major health systems around the country and even a VA uh, system also, right, I believe. Um, so how, how soon are you all hoping to see that you know, research findings that come from that are going to actually be taken up? Thank you for asking that question because I think it's a really um, exciting initiative. We're very excited about it. The Health Systems Implementation Initiative is um, set up to exactly do that, to try to help us start to narrow that gap between research findings to implementation within health systems and um, where really the research evidence is needed to move to that next step. And that's something that's a little bit unique about PCORI as a research funder is that we don't stop at just the evidence generation. We really try to push it over the finish line and, and move it to that next stage. Um, the Health Systems Implementation Initiative itself has 42 different health systems participating in it. And that reaches over 800 hospitals and systems through 800 hospitals and um, clinics throughout the country, and over 41 states in the District of Columbia reached and engaged. And so we think that this is a grand opportunity for us to not only test some things in terms of how we move research results into systems, help them build capacity for um, thinking about how they do that more effectively, whether it be tailoring electronic health, um, health record systems that really allow for certain things to move forward in protocols, protocol way, or whether or not it may require certain types of innovative approaches across teams to implement certain findings. And the other interesting thing is that with all of those systems together, there's a learning network to be able to bring together what works in one system and how to make it work in another system. And these systems are so diverse. Some of them are serving you know, majority communities that have been um, disadvantaged over many years or marginalized over many years. Others are in large academic medical centers and um, have that kind of breadth of um, diversity that those sorts of systems have. And so the opportunity to learn from each other and how this is um, how they move research evidence and practice is another real critical component to this. We are in the early stages. The systems are working on their capacity building projects to really get themselves ready for now that next stage where they choose research results that they want to focus on in terms of implementing within those systems. And we're committed to moving that through to that phase, learning through those phases, learning about it, and seeing what we can do in that reduction of that time lag that we've talked about. But that's not the only way that we really try to work on disseminating and implementing research results. We also fund um, implementation projects that help to bring things that come out of the research pipeline to scale in other areas. And one example is something um, that I thought about when we talked about acute care and uh, particularly shared decision making that happens in that acute care environment. We funded a study called the I Decide LVAD trial, and this is about um, destination therapy with left ventricular assist devices and patients that have heart failure. And the study was determining whether the shared decision making tool was effective in helping people to match their choices with their values. And it turned out that it was in terms of helping people have a greater match of their values with their choice, their ultimate decision choice about having an LVAD. And recognizing that that tool could be utilized in many different health systems, there was an implementation project that allowed it to scale up to 175 different health systems. So that's another way that we're really trying to say, how do you reduce that gap from the time that the evidence is generated to then getting something like that shared decision-making tool implemented in practice? And so I just thought I'd highlight there are multiple ways that we're working on that issue. Um, but it has to, again, be top of mind, constant attention. And in fact, even the types of research projects we fund, we start to think about the implementation of those results, even at the time <coughs> that the research is being funded. Well, I appreciate all the research uh, that's done. And I'm an operator. Mm -hmm. And I want it to come fast. I want it to shrink from 17 years to 10 years to five years to, in many cases, what feels like tomorrow. And I have to resist the temptation every day to uh, not see a piece of technology, patient engagement tool in this context, and go tell our company this is what we're going to do. And the road is littered with uh, pieces of technology that has proven not to be effective when I take it from the top of the organization and, and try to push it down. 
the most successful pieces of technology, and this isn't one technology is better than the other, but it is when it starts in that physician practice uh, with his or her patients, and we have a relationship with a remote patient monitoring company, and now we have thousands of patients that have enrolled that are active and engaged in their care, and a 300, probably more closer to 400% improvement in adherence to clinical guide, guidelines. Uh, we've seen no-show rates drop dramatically. Uh, we've seen ED visits drop uh, as well, and patients are being taken care of, and they're connected with our health system and with their practice in a different way. So making sure that I'm disciplined enough to know that the best technology and the best decisions start when it's close to the patient. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, then we can see real change. And uh, that's, that's when I get really excited. It may not be moving us closer from 17 years to one, but I can see real lives being changed. Uh, and that's the most important part of the business. So I want to <clears throat> remind the audience, uh, uh, <laughs> shortly we will have Q&A. So get your questions in, scan the QR code. We'd love to have a few from you all also. Uh, but I'll use moderator's prerogative to ask uh, a couple more here. Um, I guess for all of you, is, is there anything to be learned from industries outside of healthcare uh, in this area? Like what, what really speaks to you? I'm going to start with Kent maybe down at the other. I'll start at the other end, right? <laughs> so I, I, one topic we haven't touched on much here today is AI and utilizing those tools. And I yeah. think the rest of the world outside of healthcare is moving very quickly and trying to understand where we might apply those tools. Um, as an organization at Mayo Clinic, we're very focused on figuring out how do we make sure that we have well-curated, diverse data sets that allow us to move forward, data sets that are encompass the entire world, and that we are able to validate those capabilities so that when they're utilized to reach out to patients wherever they might be in ways that we might be able to identify ailments prior to the typical ways that we would identify them with our current clinical care, that they're well curated and they're available to anyone anywhere. And so we're focused very heavily on AI and those types of capabilities. And I think that as we can enroll those capabilities into some of the ways that we're delivering care beyond our traditional environments, that'll allow us to be much more effective sooner. And so I think the rest of the world's moving quick. I think healthcare needs to do the same can thing. Can you believe I actually did have an AI question written down here? <laughs> I was going to ask. But well, I, well, let's, all right, let's take a pause on this for a second. Um, so, I mean, Kent, how, how do you think about, um, and I'm not thinking just about chatbots because those things, obviously, we, we have a lot of that already, right? But generative AI. Um, what are, the, what are the benefits as well as the risks of, of you know, incorporating it into our health system? So certainly there are those um, capabilities that reduce administrative burden. I was thinking more related to the actual delivery of clinical care. Right. So tools in the cardiology world, for instance, um, in our organization, our cardiologists have been able to develop tools whereby you can take a 12 lead ECG and identify heart failure, cardiomyopathies, um, actually before they even manifest themselves clinically. Well, then we learned that we could use a single lead EKG to be able to do that. Then we learned that you could be able to do it with a smartwatch. Well, we were developing those tools largely for the care that we deliver in our own environment, but now our cardiologists are able to take that type of a tool and they're using it to run clinical trials in Nigeria in, in uh, pregnant and peripartum and postpartum patients who have high incidence of cardiomyopathy. So having tools like that we can, that we can distribute broadly across our organization, they help our care, but then they can be utilized well beyond our walls. Mm -hmm. All right, sorry, sorry to jump for a second, but yeah, let's, well, let's go back to, so Florian, um, anything to be learned from industries outside of healthcare, like what really, you mentioned Uber earlier, but I take it you might have something else. Yeah, I, th I think there are actually a lot of industries where you can, can learn from and, and also understanding <clears throat> where the fundamental problem is. I think on the technology side, um, we are basically in healthcare probably 20 years behind travel and maybe 40 years behind other enterprises. So what do I basically mean with that? You usually have systems of record and systems of engagement. So systems of records, something like SAP or Oracle. Enterprises in the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, <clears throat> literally got everybody adapt this. Then at some point, the, 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 there was a big discrepancy between what the consumer or what the company need and what are these systems offering. Then you had verticals coming on top of that. You had um, Workday coming on top of that. You had NetSuite coming out of that. So verticalization on top of that. In travel, GDS systems like Sabre and Amadeus, good systems of record, no chance patients can engage with them. So you need to verticalize that by the apps on top of it. <clears throat> or for example, Expedia or Kayak. 
banking is also a very good example. Banking, literally, you have these, these systems of, of record which are written COBOL. No chance any consumer can engage with them. But they made a really good transition of mobile banking to build a layer between the end consumer and these systems of record. And I think those are industries that really have done a good transition towards becoming consumer first. We in healthcare, we are probably still 10 or 20 years behind on that. We made the first step, implementing the systems of record, which are the EHRs, and I think right now 99% probably penetration on that. What still is missing is this connection between the EHR and the consumer. No chance the EHRs can build that, no chance. It's a very different technology stack. You need somebody to bridge this gap. So I think those are very interesting ways to see. It's coming in healthcare, and I'm very, very excited about it. I think it's awesome. I think for us, uh, hospitality and travel are, are two places that I look as, as far as learnings go. I was halfway around the world last week, and I had the opportunity to go visit a hospital, and the team member that gave me a tour of the hospital, uh, I asked her her background, and she and her entire team came out of the travel business. And I just thought that was, it was very interesting. We've had a lot of discussions uh, in our office around the learnings at scale when you have distributed locations like we have. We don't have just one healthcare system in one location where I could literally walk downstairs and touch and see and feel everything that's going on. We're in over 30 states with hundreds of locations. And I think for us, there's some learnings in travel and hospitality in addition to the technology changes that you mentioned as well. Well, I echo many things that were already said around opportunities and data, et cetera, but I think one of the things that we really learned during the pandemic is the importance of um, taking into account the full person when we're thinking about a health interaction or a health exchange. And so um, we've started to focus at PCORI on the broader aspect of a person outside of even the clinic. And that means focusing on social determinants of health. And I think that introduces a whole new opportunity for the way we think about partnerships related to either research or healthcare delivery, because there are many people and organizations who have focused in these areas for a long time that bring many lessons learned to the table. And so, um, you know, we're we're learning from partnerships and um, explorations with, you know, those that have worked in housing, those that have worked in education those that have worked in other um, financial assistance types of roles. And so I think there are lessons to be learned in those types of partnerships and interactions that have a lot to bear on the work that we do and trying to integrate really that approach to thinking about healthcare with the accounting for the social determinants. And that initiative I mentioned earlier around the partner funding opportunity focuses on interventions that both deal with the clinical um, issue at hand, as well as a social determinant or social determinants issues that are influencing that clinical outcome. And so I think we have a lot to learn from sectors that have done that work for a long period of time and important to bring them in. And yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a hard one to go last on, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll try. So I think for, for me uh, in particular, I think of financial services, right? Because extremely complex industry, but they've done, I think, a better job of engaging the patient. And one of the, uh, of the, the consumer, one of the things that I feel is missing from a patient engagement perspective is the patient incentive to engage. Like in financial services, if you have a good credit score, you get a lower interest rate. Like there's a clear line that can be drawn between accountability and outcomes. And I think that piece is missing in healthcare. And if you're able to introduce that incentive, I think we'll see a lot more engagement from patients that will truly help everyone. I think that, can I, can I add something to yeah. that? So I think, um, it's very interesting that you share that. And, and there are some products, I think, in healthcare that are kind of in between, like HSAs, FSAs. Yes. So <clears throat> it's a very interesting product because um, I don't know if you know this, this stat. More than $100 billion is sitting in HSAs or FSA basically idle. Yes. So what is the fundamental problem? People don't know that it exists or they don't know the pin for their card. Yeah. No, really. It's absolutely what's, what's happening. So we found out that um, people that are eligible for an HSA, in 43% of the cases, pay with a credit card. That's probably post-tax dollars. Mm -hmm. So we launched one more product um, as part of this, um, this um, uh, financial assistance, which is uh, the following. When you right now um, get your bill, 
there's a direct integration with your HSA, FSA. So it shows you in the bill, oh, you have, you're owing $370, but you have $250 left in your health equity account. Click here to immediately apply that. And that, of course, helps already a lot with this payment. And these literally, yeah, $100 billion that, that is owned by the patient, and in the FSA case, it's lost at the end of the year. So extremely important to make patients aware of that. And that's, of course, um, really, really good because it's pre-tax dollars. I want to get to a couple of audience questions because, thank you all, you guys, you followed instructions. I have so many here. <laughs> so let me try to get through a few. Um, for any one of you or all of you, do any of your organizations engage patients directly in identifying challenges and designing solutions? If so, what does that look like? If not, how can patients be more involved in these efforts to ensure the solutions best serve their needs? You know, technology, we, we have a lot of technology that we use, uh, but one of the things uh, that, that I go back to uh, month in, month out in our company, and that is our patient engagement councils. Nothing like getting people around the table to talk. And we've, uh, we've formed patient engagement councils in our locations that bring patients together uh, to talk with our medical staff and our administrative team uh, about challenges. And things are just so obvious and so small, but when you make that small change, just by simply listening. And yes, we can gather that from technology, but getting together in person uh, has really proven to be the absolute best tool. I would just add, similarly, in our organization, we have patient advisory councils as well. I can give you an example how they're impacting the experience that they'll have in the future. We're in the process of, of a significant um, hospital bed tower expansion. And from the first day of planning for that, really significant due diligence, benchmarking outside of our industry, within our industry, across the country. But front and center were the patients early on. And we built up mock-up rooms, multiple mock-up rooms, which we built, rebuilt, rebuilt again, multiple times based on the feedback from those patients so that the experience will be based on what their needs are. Mm. Fascinating. I, I would add that, um, you know, at, at Picori, patient engagement happens throughout everything that we do mm -hmm. and starts with e even helping us to identify what we want to focus on for the research studies that we fund. And um, so we have a patient engagement and advisory panel, but we also bring patients into all of our convenings, all of our activities. And I think one of the critical components that we hear from researchers and others who are actually conducting the work is that it's never too late to engage a patient or um, in that often what they are hearing is that you want to have them engage from the very beginning because it helps reduce the cyclical nature of, oh, I wish I had done it that way if I had talked to them earlier, but that it always improves the design, the outcome of the study if they're engaged at any point in time. And so um, I just think it's critical to think about it throughout every stage. Um, so let me see here. So many questions, this is awesome. Okay, so, mm, so I'm going to ask about what strategies do you all suggest um, for historically marginalized communities that experience systemic exclusion due to lower rates of internet or cell phone access, lower health and digital literacy, et cetera? Yeah, I spend, I spend personally a lot of time here in DC working with policymakers on ensuring that that access is there, and I think we've come a long way, but there are still so many pockets around the country where we don't have the access that our patients need. Uh, you know, access, it could be access to financial services, but just basic access to information, and it's kind of hard to believe that's the case. Uh, but when I travel out to some of our communities, and then I see where some of our patients and their families live, even in smaller communities by themselves, uh, that last mile, if you will, is so critical. Uh, so policymakers, I think, have come a long way. I think we need to continue to invest in that to really leverage the tools to the fullest. But that shouldn't slow us down. We can still reach most of our patients today, uh, but reaching every one of our patients should be our goal. And I think we're making some progress, but we're not there yet. I would just also add um, it's important to listen to the best way to to engage because what we've learned from certain community brokers or individuals who work in communities is that they'll tell you, you know, that if, if you're going to use a cell phone, don't do video interactions here, text only because that's what gets through. And so hearing that kind of information and feedback, I think, in the listening component of what works in different environments is one way to try to bridge those kinds of divides in the setting that we're working in currently while, of course, there are other issues going on from a policy perspective. 
Uh, one, <clears throat> one of the access problems that we we found right now, not to access care, but on the financial side, is language. Actually, <laughs> it's a big problem for a lot of uh, marginalized communities. They don't speak English. They might not even speak Spanish, but they speak another language, and um, it's not very helpful um, to to try to engage with them than in, in such a language. So being extremely specific and technology is a really beautiful thing because you can immediately translate everything into 150 languages and that makes them really feel, okay, they're part of it and they're being taken care of because they're in the center of everything. And I think the only thing I'll add is being able to reach out to them where they're going to be present, right? Like if it's a church, I mean, it's, it's reaching out to them and engaging them where they're already present. I think it's extremely hard to expect you know, people to do something differently just to engage with the healthcare system. Do you, you have to figure out what's the highest chance of them, of the patients to engage and in which setting, and then being there is important. Mm -hmm. um, so next question is, how have you all been working to engage the growing role of caregivers in meeting patients where they are? Who wants to take that one? Ooh, we got a stump. Everyone stumped. <laughs> we, we have embraced the concept that patients are part of a, a dynamic um, environment, which often means someone that's caring for them, family members, friends that are family, and others, and that they often have a particular perspective that is important to hear and understand. Um, in the research at Bakori, we focused on um, making sure we're engaging patients as well as caregivers, and some of the research actually focuses on the caregiver experience to really understand what works best for them as well. And so I, I would say that we've fully embraced it in our work and hopefully generating that type of evidence that will allow the health systems to understand what works best for caregivers as well. Completely agree. Like we have uh, advanced care planning, right? Like that's another place where you need the family members to be engaged. And we've seen fabulous um, like responses from family members that because the engagement process is important in making sure that it actually happens. Um, so whether it's you know anyone who's going through an acute incident, like engaging family members is important and also needed uh, for the outcomes to be good. Mm -hmm. you know, our workforce got dislocated like probably everybody else is. Uh, that's here. We relied heavily on contract labor, traveling nurses, and that certainly put a dent uh, in the continuity of care with uh, out-of-town uh, team members coming in for maybe long shifts, but shifts, and then leaving and going back home. Uh, one of the great parts of our organization, being in smaller communities, is our caregivers, our doctors and our nurses are, uh, yes, they're taking care of patients, but they're taking care of their next door neighbor. Uh, my son-in-law is a nurse in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, he doesn't know his patients, in many cases, the way that our care caregivers know their patients. It may be their teacher, it may be their, in, in their church group, in their community group, and, and that is something that's very unique and very special that I think gives us, uh, I don't know, a built-in advantage, if you will, in engaging with our patients because it's community taking care of community in almost its truest sense, uh, and that gives me a lot of encouragement for the future. I would just add to the, the caregiver experience. One of the really nice things mentioned at, at the beginning about our home hospital capability is when patients are hospitalized in their own home, you get a really in-depth understanding of who those caregivers are, what is that relationship, how connected are they, how engaged are they, and that makes for an easier transition once they're um, you know, leaving that home hospital environment as opposed to where they're just in a regular bricks and mortar hospital. You don't get to see what that environment's like, and then they go home and they might run into issues. You can deal with them up front, so that's one of the benefits of having that type of remote care. I think that that is all the time that we have. Um, so thank you all. Please join me in thanking. Uh